today it's great to have Gleb Zipersky on the podcast. Gleb is the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, where he consults, coaches, and trains leaders on decision making and risk management strategy. A cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist, Dr. Zipersky has over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues such as Psychology Today, USA Today, Fast Company, CBS News, Time, and elsewhere. He's also a best selling author known for Never Go With Your Gut How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. His new book is The Blind Spots Between Us How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. Available at disasteravoidanceexperts.com slash blind spots. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, and to avoid disaster in his personal life, he makes sure to spend ample he makes sure to spend ample time with his wife. Very, very smart. That's probably your smartest decision. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, yes, definitely. My smartest decision was to marry my wife and keep a really long relationship. Gosh, how long has it been already? It's been 17 years. Wow. So that's that's been something that I value and treasure very much. It is definitely most important relationship in my wife and the, uh, in my life and the smartest one, <laughs> the smartest decision that I made. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, that's really wonderful, Gwen. And uh, congratulations to both of you. Thank you. This book, this uh, really cool book. Uh, you know, when we you hinted at this book idea when we spoke on the podcast a while ago, and I remember I don't know if you remember my reaction was whoa, who's I've never seen a book on. Uh, blind spots research applied in the relationships domain domain before, mm-hmm. you know, um, especially yeah. kind of with your message, which is don't always trust your gut. You know, a lot of these books in the in the hippy dippy spiritual <laughs> realm of love yeah. and you know free love, all that stuff is saying just go with the gut, you know, and you can't go wrong. But what what's wrong yeah. with that? Well, what's wrong with going with our gut, and what these books really get wrong is that our gut is really not adapted for the modern world. That's the big problem. So thinking about our gut, what is that? It's our instincts, it's our intuition, it's our feelings, it's our emotions, and they are built for the savanna environment. And we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. That's what our gut is for. Mm. I mean, think about that tribalism response, right? We needed in that tribal environment to be very strongly oriented toward other members of our tribe, to like people who look like us, who think like us, who have the same values that we do. And to be hostile to those who aren't, because if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, they'd conquer our tribes and we die. And if we weren't sufficiently loyal to our tribe, they'd kick us out of our tribe and we'd die. You notice we're the descendants of folks who didn't die. <laughs> so we are very tribally oriented. That's one example that's really a bad fit for the modern world. I mean, if, imagine how the modern world would work if we only went with our gut reactions on tribalism. We can't have complex modern organizations, and we can't have relationships with people who are different from us, whether romantic relationships or friendship relationships or professional relationships. That takes overcoming our gut intuitions and our desire to go with people who are like us. That's one broad pattern of blind spots, these cognitive biases that we need to address. Another one is called the fight or flight response. Now, the fight or flight response, you might be familiar with it as the saber to tiger response when we had to jump at a hundred shadows to get away from that one saber to tiger. And you know, the ones who got away from that saber to tiger faster, they're the ones who respond, who survived and thrived and we're their descendants. So right now we still have a very strong stress response when we have any stimulus, any external stimulus that we perceive as threatening. That's great for when we need to get ourselves out of the way of a moving bus. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's a perfect response for that situation. But when our loved one says something that is hurtful or upsetting to us, the temptation is to either withdraw, that's the flight response, or attack, that's the aggressive response. Neither of those are the right responses. Now, some folks are more of the withdraw type. Some folks are more of the aggressive type. I'm definitely more of the aggressive type. And I know I have to restrain that within myself. And you need to know what your blind spots are and how to address them because so many people just respond with their gut to what their loved one says or what their colleague says or what their friend says, and that gets them into a whole heap of trouble. So we can talk about that. But that's the kind of tendencies that come with going with our gut, and they're really bad for relationships in the modern world. So all of those books, they're doing a huge, huge disservice to everyone by telling people to go with their gut, follow their heart, trust their intuition, because it gets them into a whole heap of trouble when they do. Yeah. I, I've heard the uh, the four Fs. I don't know if you heard about the four Fs. Fight, 
uh, flight, fight, flight, freeze, mm-hmm. and beep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a four yeah. letter word. So it seems like that's that true. four letter word, that's, that's a good one. We're okay with that, <laughs> right? <laughs> As a response. <laughs> well, it can be, but sometimes it's not always the right response. Yeah, let's be honest. No, of but course, yes, that's, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Out yeah, of the yeah, four, yeah. if you but gave me the four options and you said pick one, <laughs> you know, that's that, that that's definitely a good, uh, decent response. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the people who and notice the people who did that, you know, they're the ones who fried yeah. and reproduced, right? Yeah, that's yeah, why we're here. Often in the modern environment, not the right response. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. It, context matters for sure. Um, it does. It does. And our gut does not respond well to context. Oh, interesting. That's the thing. It just doesn't. Our, when we look at the world, we very much go with our intuition, our feeling, and we're not really focusing on the context of the nuance, the subtleties. We l- fall into these dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases. So that's a huge problem for us. Yeah, it's huge. Um, cause of a lot of strife and um, even at the most extreme homicide, you know, and um, all over the world, you look at all these kinds of consequences of these sorts of things in relationships. And if you can crack this this code, you know you can you can really help save a lot of uh, lives. I would say it's true. It's true. It's lives. It's relationships. Everything. Because we, when you look at tribalism, it's a cause for so much conflict, so much discord, so much strife. That's really unnecessary. I mean, certainly in America right now, looking at the kind of polarization that we have the tribalism, where people focus on those differences that divide us instead of what unites us. I mean, look at what unites us. We all care about our families. We all want a safe life. We all want health. We all want to have reasonable material things, right? We share 95%, even with the people who you disagree the most, Mm. you share 95% of what makes up your life. You disagree even with the most extreme people on 5%. And why do we focus on those 5% where we disagree instead of the 95% where we agree? Well, that's tribalism. That's what it drives us to do. And that's a big problem. And we don't realize how dangerous it is in modern society. And that's only the United States. Of course, in other countries, tribalism can get into much more dangerous situations. Well, right now we're having some conflicts and protesters that do kill people, but that's less frequent in the U.S. than outside the U.S., as you rightly point out, Scott where people are actually killed yeah. daily because of this tribalism, you know, ethnic conflicts, religious conflicts, so deadly and so dangerous and so unnecessary. I think what you're saying is quite right, but is a tribalism the only explanation? You know, you think about um, the phenomenon that you have fraternal twins or, or like firstborns, secondborns, thirdborns, they're all competing for their mother's attention. You know, like, mm-hmm. I don't think that, tribalism necessarily makes sense is the answer to that but um you know you said why do we when we agree on so much why do we disagree um why do we focus on the five percent we disagree with it could also just be we're trying to be be an individual (laughs) you know we're trying to like Mm -hmm. show that we you know stand out in some way in our beliefs you know we kind of kind of get caught up in in uh in talking about our own belief system because it makes us feel unique Mm -hmm. and it's definitely important for us to be able to feel unique and make sure that we have our sense of fulfillment, but that doesn't need to involve fighting with other groups. And so here's one of the cognitive biases called the in-group, out-group bias, where when we look at people who are part of our group, usually within families, you look at families and they're part of your group, right? Mm -hmm. So you stand up for your brother and you stand up for your sister, even when they did some, you know, pretty bad things. (laughs) Yeah. And that may not be a really good thing for our society. You know, do you want people to stand for your brother? I mean, there are a number of cases of, you know, let's say judges, politicians who have you know, corrupt brothers, corrupt sisters. I mean, and all of, and they protect them in a corrupt way that really harms our society. And that's the same thing happens with, with business leaders who get yeah. their you know, cousins to work for them. And that really harms the morale, harms teamwork and everything else like that. And th- that family is just, of course, one group. You also have, I mean, I was, this is a good example. I was giving a presentation to HR leaders here in Columbus, Ohio. So I, you, this is where I live, Columbus, Ohio. And the, this is the home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. So that's what we're famous for. And uh, they have big, big football. I thought they were famous for Gleb Zipersky. They are. But besides that, okay. <laughs> they're famous for the University of 
for the football rivalry with the University of Michigan Wolverines. Unfortunately, this year the game was canceled because of COVID. You know, those Wolverines got the COVID and we couldn't oh, no. beat them this year, unfortunately. So that's unfortunate for <laughs> fortunate for them that they missed out on a drop. So what yeah. happened was that this was 2018, so long before the pandemic, and I was speaking here in Columbus, Ohio, to a diversity inclusion conference of HR leaders, over 100 HR leaders. This Mine was the closing keynote. And I asked these over 100 re- HR leaders in Columbus, Ohio, how many of you would hire a University of Michigan fan? How many of you would hire Wolverines fan? So out of those over 100 people, only three of them raised their hand. Mm. Only three would hire a University of Michigan fan. Now, and the nice thing is, I was that was being recorded, so I have it on video. <laughs> only three people are raising their hand. It's, it's silly, but the sense of tribalism around team, people are passionate, and it's all about our emotions, our feelings, our intuition. People get really into teams, into that spirit, and they feel a strong sense of antipathy, a dislike. That's the outgroup. The University of Michigan, the Wolverines are the outgroup. And of course, it doesn't matter for your ability to perform on the job, whether you're a fan of the Buckeyes or the Wolverines, right? But that sense of antipathy, teamwork is really harmful. That's kind of an example in the workplace, of course. So many other examples are that in-group, out-group bias harms us, harms our society in many ways, causes folks to make really bad decisions. Yeah. Hey everyone, I'm excited to announce that the eight-week online Transcend course is back. This iteration of the course, which will run from September 5th to October 24th of this year, will use science to help you live a more fulfilling, meaningful, creative, and self-actualized life. There will be limited slots available, so save your spot as soon as possible. In addition to the regular class pricing, we're also offering limited slots for personal self-actualization coaching. Save your spot today by going to transcendcourse.com. That's transcendcourse.com. The Transcend course is just one of the offerings of the brand new Center for the Science of Human Potential. The Center for the Science of Human Potential's mission is to use science to help each person fulfill their highest potential and contribute to the good of society. Toward that goal, we offer classes, coaching, and consulting opportunities to help people apply the latest science to help themselves, their organizations, their schools, their families, and their communities to be more creative, loving, and full of transcendent possibilities. For more on the center, you can go to scienceofhumanpotential.com. Hey everyone, doing this podcast for y'all is one of my greatest privileges, but the cost of maintaining a professional production like this one really adds up. I'm grateful to today's sponsors who help fund the show, but if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. You'll get completely ad-free episodes all while directly supporting the show for as little as $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash psych podcast. Are you, do you think they were serious though? Like, I think they were, of course. Yes. I mean, I, I asked those in follow-ups. Yes. So there were, when I do this and so that was a, a keynote of a hundred people, right? Yeah. When I do intimate trainings and I do those for HR leaders, for executives, I ask them in Columbus, Ohio, elsewhere, I look up, you know, what the local football rivalry is. And I ask them and I generally get similar responses, you know, 80 to 90% of them won't hire somebody. And I asked them, you know, why? And they're like, well, I just feel uncomfortable working with this person, you know, just having a negative feelings toward this person. That's, that's what it causes it, these negative feelings, these gut reactions. They trust their gut. You know, what the essence of trusting their gut means is that if you feel something that is true, then you believe it's true. If you feel a certain course of action is right, then you believe it's right. If you feel that your heart is, you know, to pursue this person, even though that might be a very, very bad fit for you, then you will pursue this person. And if you feel, you know, your friend did something to betray you, even though that might be completely untrue, you will still feel angry with your friend. And then, so that's kind of the difference between feelings and what is actually the reality. <laughs> and we let our feelings guide us. Mm-hmm. We, let, we trust that gut reaction, the tribalism, the fight or flight response over what actually benefits us and what benefits our relationship and can have some pretty terrible consequences for us. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That also can stunt a possibility for a beautiful relationship. Yes. You know, absolutely. if you give it a chance. You're absolutely right, Scott. Or it can lead into a really bad relationship. There's a reason about 40% plus of 
marriages in the U.S. end in divorce, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's because people choose others based on tribalist responses, based on kind of fight or flight things. We'll talk about tribalism. We talked about in-group and out-group bias. There's another related cognitive bias pattern called the halo effect and the horns effect. So the halo effect is if you like one characteristic of someone, you will tend to like all of their other characteristics. And the horns effect is if you dislike one characteristic of someone, you will tend to dislike all of their other characteristics. Now, folks listening to this, watching this, might hear that I have an accent, right? I clearly, I'm not from around here, right? My parents came from a country called Moldova in the Soviet Union that took part of the territory when I was 10. This is when, an international uh, podcast, by the way, so I may be the one with the accent. <laughs> I, but this is the case yeah. that people still hear I have an accent, yes. right? I don't have a mainstream American accent. Okay. Okay. And this is what this is what I'm talking about. So I don't have that mainstream American accent. And when you, I came to the United States, I grew up in New York City. So that was a cultural melting pot. And I decided that hey, my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. So I decided to keep my accent. Mm -hmm. Many immigrants chose to, especially those who didn't live in a cultural melting pot, decided to get rid of it. Well, when I was getting my PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, I learned that that was kind of a dumb decision mm -hmm. because of phenomenon called accent discrimination, where people who don't have that mainstream American accent are perceived to be less trustworthy, less credible. Mm -hmm. They are perceived to be worse than others who do have that mainstream American accent. And this applies not simply to foreign accents. This applies to regional accents in the U.S. as well. So let's say someone with a southern accent would be perceived as less trustworthy, less credible than someone with a mainstream American accent or someone with a New York accent or something like that. So that is a really problematic dynamic. And that comes because of the horn effect, where you hear an accent, that somebody has an accent, and that's not the mainstream American accent. And the immediate gut reaction is, oh, that's a weird person. That's different, not from my tribe. That's the kind of immediate reaction you get. And that works for a number of other dynamics. So, for example, people who, obviously, this is a part of racism and religious-based discrimination, all of these isms, the, all of these discriminations come in w terms of the horns effect going on. There are other aspects of the horns effect that are really interesting to examine. So, for example, one thing is obesity. People who are perceived as obese get much less ahead in life than people who aren't perceived as a beast. And that's because you don't like that characteristic of someone because it's perceived as a negative thing in our society to be obese. People, the halo effect is the opposite. When you like that characteristic, you will tend to hire a person. So if you're a Buckeye fan and you are interviewing a Buckeye fan, you will tend to hire that person, even though they might not deserve to be hired against somebody who is a neutral, you know, fan of a neutral team or doesn't care about college football at all. And if somebody has an attractive appearance compared to men, women, compared to the mainstream of appearance, what we consider to be attractive, they tend to be hired at a greater rate. They tend to be in more relationships. They tend to get further ahead in life. Same thing applies, by the way, to taller men. So I got lucky in that. I'm six one. So men who are, you know, the average height of a, for a man is something like 5'8", 5'7", 5'8", in the United States. And People who are above, significantly above that height get further ahead in life. People who are below that height don't get further ahead in life because there, there's an association with tribalism and leadership. In a tribal environment, people who are taller were physically more fit and they were seen as leaders. They were seen as kind of, oh, these are the people who I want to have relationships with, who I want to lead me. And those are the people who tend to get ahead in life because of that halo effect. So those are some other patterns of dynamics that relate back to our evolutionary psychology that have some pretty negative consequences in the modern world, where people who have otherwise great characteristics either don't get ahead when they should, and people who don't have very good characteristics get ahead even if they shouldn't. I was just talking to a coaching client who was saying that she, she was one of the few women executives in GE who about 30 years ago, when she, and she was one of the lowest... Like, under 1% of female executives in GE at that time. And she was telling me that the first time she came to a meeting of major executives, kind of executives from GE, she was shocked that the room was full of super tall white men. <laughs> super tall white men. Not simply white men. Not, but that's understandable for that time period, right? 
but people who are all pretty uniformly above six feet. So, and that is an example of how these people get ahead. Do you, you know, the, uh, there's a, a big push to have more diversity in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Do you think we should um, push to have more five foot uh, six people uh, in the workplace and five foot four people? And uh, should we have more diversity of height? I think we should definitely have look at whatever factors research shows are discriminated against and address those discriminations. We know that research shows that there's discrimination against height. And that's, that's, what, is, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. So that's what the peer review. Theory. We definitely know there's the, the discrimination against people who are obese. And I definitely think that that should be addressed as well. I think there should be more effort put on addressing issues of ethnicity because of the cultural problems around ethnicity in this country with discrimination against African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Hispanic-Americans, and so on, because of that more, because of that focus, because of that cultural heritage, because of that history. There should be, especially with African-Americans, there should be more focus placed on that. But I think all sorts of discriminatory impulses and tendencies, I think there should be a, a way to address the discrimination against Wolverine fans and Buckeyes, because these are all problematic tendencies. People need to know this. People need to understand that our gut reactions cause us to make really bad decisions about other people. And that's what they're, you know, that's why I wrote the book about relationships. It's like what you said in the beginning. Why do we, well, why is that book important? Because we make really bad mistakes about other people. And that hurts us. And we're talking about only one aspect of these mistakes about the tribalism. And there's so many other aspects of the book we can dive into. But we just want to be highlight that this is a problem and this is something that really needs to be addressed. And it's something that the way it's addressed right now, I get really frustrated because the way that the large majority of diversity inclusion programs work is they talk about ways of shaming and guilting white majority males into accepting minorities, women, and so on. That's a really bad tendency. That's a very bad approach to diversity inclusion. When you look at the research, it's just like fat shaming. people. You're going to what? You're going to think, but just by fat shaming a fat person, you'll get that fat person to lose weight? No, that's not what the research shows. It's intuitive to us. You know, why, why is fat shaming a thing? Because you know, your mother intuitively feels that fat shaming you will work. That's what her gut reaction tells her is the right thing to do to criticize, make negative comments about you know, weight and so on. And that's what your friends feel is the right thing to do and your relatives and so on. And that's why fat shaming and all other sorts of shaming are so prevalent in our society and including discrimination shaming, where it's people who are discriminated are shamed. That's not a good approach. When you look at the research on how do you actually address diversity and inclusion, you need to show people that this is part of their evolutionary heritage Tribalism is natural. Everyone falls into it. This is the halo effect, horns effect, you know, the in-group bias, out-group bias. Mm. This is natural. It's a natural tendency. So how do you actually address, let's say, eating? You don't address it by shaming people. You say it's natural for us to be triggered by sugar. You know, in the savanna environment, it was very important for us to be triggered by when we came across a source of honey or something like that. It was very important for us to eat as much of it as possible in order to survive and thrive with the descendants of those who succeeded in doing so, and then reproduced and so on. Well, in the modern environment, that's very bad. If you come across you know, a box of donuts in the workplace that a graceful vendor sent you and it's kind of sitting there uh, over, open for everyone, it's very tempting to maybe you know, take half a donut. And then once you take half a donut, I mean, it's pretty tempting to take the other half. And then you know, before you know it, you t- you're taking you half the box of God, right? <laughs> so that's a tendency that many people oh, yeah. have because they're triggered by sugar. It's very tempting. So you need to, instead of that, choose a different set of habits, like, for example, passing by that donuts and going for the bowl of fruit that another vendor sent. Much less tasty, much less you know, <laughs> desirable, <laughs> that unprocessed food, but it's much healthier. So folks have hopefully who are checking out this podcast have hopefully developed habits that help them make the right decisions in those challenging situations in order to have a healthy eating habit. So that's physical health. It's the same thing for fitness. It's not intuitive for us to go to the gym or not to go to the gym in the middle of the pandemic, but let's say exercise at home, right? Do yoga or something like that. I do yoga. That's, it's not something intuitive for me. It's not comfortable. But it's something I learned to do, just like I learned to eat in a better manner that my gut reaction tells me to do. And in the same way, 
we need to address discrimination in the workplace and in personal relationships, these halo effects and horns effects, these in-group and out-group biases, tribalism. There are specific strategies and habits that you can use that I talk about in my consulting coaching practice, and I talk about, of course, in the book, that you can use to address these negative, harmful patterns in our minds that cause us to have these, make these bad decisions about other people. But you can't come from it from a shaving perspective. You have to say, this is a pattern that you need to address through developing better habits. And that's the better mental habits. That's the key to addressing these dangerous judgment errors. Nice. I don't think you took a breath at all in that whole thing. <laughs> well, thank you. Very I'm passionate nice. about this. I'm I can passionate tell. about this issue, as you can tell. I can tell, absolutely. Um, can you describe one of the more interesting cognitive biases uh, that I read in your book, the illusion of transparency? Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little about that and how do we work to avoid this error in judgment? How can we? Happy to. The illusion of transparency has to do with communication. You know, right now in this podcast, we're communicating, trying to convey some ideas. Well, the intuitive thing to feel for me and for you and for everyone else is that we're great communicators. We feel in an illusionary manner that our thoughts and our feelings and our message is fully transparent to other people. Mm -hmm. That whatever we convey to people is 100% received, integrated, accepted, and celebrated. <laughs> well, maybe not the last, but the, that it's fully received. That's how actually reality works. What you need to understand is that, first of all, there might be a lot of technical issues in communicating. In the modern age of Zoom, right, with a pandemic, a lot of technical issues, glitches, people might not be hearing you, and so on. Stuff might be going on in their home that you might not be aware of that might be distracting them. Who knows, right? Who knows? That's kind of one. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of one area. Then they might be hearing you, but they might be not paying sufficiently good attention. Mm -hmm. They might be distracted. They might be, you know, looking at their phone or thinking about what they're going to eat for dinner or that meeting they're going to have with their boss, right? Something that's preoccupying them. Their, so their attention is not focused on you and they're missing a part of the message that you're conveying. So there's an attention issue. Then it's an interpretation issue. They might have different ways of thinking about the terms that you're using. You know, different people, let's say you use the term several. What does several mean? What does a few mean? What does a couple mean? And those are just the some of the terms that we have different interpretations around and people feel that their interpretation is the right one. They don't even check to confirm that the other person has the right interpretation of the term. And of course, then there's a lot of cognitive biases that cause them to have filters around what they're hearing from you. Another cognitive bias that I talk about in the book is called the confirmation bias, where we look for information that confirms our beliefs and we ignore information that doesn't confirm to our beliefs. So let's say you're hearing information from somebody, let's say your loved one is telling you, you know, to clean up your socks. And they're telling you, you know, this is the fifth time that you didn't clean up your socks. And you're kind of, what you're hearing from is, oh, they, they're, just the, they're just, you know, nagging me again. You're not hearing kind of their frustration, their concerns, their underlying anxiety and their urges that cause them to talk about this topic to you. You're just kind of ignoring them as noise. And that's what happens to people. Or the same thing happens in the workplace, you know, when somebody is, you know, is getting constructive critical feedback and they have a defensive response and they shut down and they're ignoring what the other person is mm -hmm. saying. That happens all the time. You know, so many leaders don't know how to give good constructive critical feedback because they're not aware of the flight response and the freeze response. So when we're talking about the, the fight, flight, or freeze response. By the way, the freeze response is kind of an internal flight where you're fleeing within yourself. Mm. So the, the, either the flight response or the freeze response would cause people who are getting constructive critical feedback to withdraw from the situation, ignore what they're being told, and not focus on it. And leaders just assume that whenever they give constructive critical feedback, the other person will just do what they say. That's not how the world works. And so the illusion of transparency has to do and of course, we can talk about how to fix that. But the illusion of transparency has to do with this tendency, the tendency to fail to understand that our message is far from 100% getting through to the other people. Yeah. So we often have that, we operate under that illusion. And it's, uh, uh, I mean, how in the world do we see reality more clearly? I mean, do you have any advice on listening skills or? 
Anything sure. Like that, so with the, with illusion of transparency, let's talk about this at first. What you want to do is, first of all, understand where the other person is coming from. If they have, if they're likely to have some kind of emotional reaction to what you're talking about, then you need to understand, okay, assume that they will have some kind of emotional reaction, model what kind of emotional reaction they will have. Maybe they'll have a defensive response, aggressive response. Maybe they'll feel like ignoring you because this is kind of the 10th time you've been repeating the same thing. And by the way, you shouldn't be repeating the same thing 10 times. That means that whatever you're doing doesn't work. So whatever is happening, you want to anticipate their emotional responses. And you want to understand what their emotional responses are so you can address the emotion under the content of what you're saying. So you don't want to simply think about, you know, I'm going to target their head, but you want to think about targeting their gut because they are interpreting your words through their gut, not their head, overwhelmingly speaking, when we're talking about an emotional response. So you want to speak to their emotions. You want to address their emotions. You want to calm them down. You want to make sure that they're hearing what you're saying and their emotions are hearing what you're saying. Then you want to check for understanding. So you don't want to simply say, you know, here's the thing, I, and I assume that you understood it. You want to check for understanding by saying something like, oh, hey, so can you clarify what, what you think of what I'm saying? And you want to make sure that the person in response actually gives you a clarification or gives you an indication of what they think that you're saying okay. and you and that what they think you're saying is actually what you're saying because that sort of checking for understanding gets you to have a discussion about okay not what i meant and, and you want to always make sure that you take this on yourself don't blame the other person for misunderstanding which is so often what happens in communication very bad tendency, really not something you want to do. Don't say, you know, you're dumb, you misunderstood me. <laughs> Don't say something like, like, I apologize that I miscommunicated. You know, he, what I meant to say was X, not yeah. Y. So let's talk about Y. Well, and let's, let's talk about this issue. So that's something that you want to make sure to do. So speak to other people's emotions and check for understanding. Apologize, take the blame for yourself for any miscommunication, and then make sure that you correct whatever misunderstanding exists. That's great. Great advice. Um, so let me make sure that I understood your point correctly about intuition. I'm going to apply your principle to something I was thinking. You said uh, trusting your intuition is bad advice. Could it be that there are individual differences, though, in um, how naturally some of these principles come to people versus don't? Like, there are some people, um, and I'm not saying you, but because um, I don't know you that well, but there's some people who they're so rational people that they don't they don't, you know, a lot of people in the autism spectrum, for instance, these, a lot of these, they need rules and, and they need to cognitively understand all the cognitive biases and they want to break it all down and systematize it. But then there are other people who just intuitively get these things. And it's like, yeah, obviously. Um, now, so don't you think that like, there are some people that, um, that are just naturals at relationships that, uh, that are more likely not to fall prey to the illusion of transparency because of their intuition is so well-developed? Um, I just wanted to discuss this with you. Oh, yeah. I think it's a very important topic. There are some people who are naturally more empathetic than others. Yeah. So it's not that their intuition is developed. There's a specific... Let me make sure to clarify what intuition is. So when we talk about intuition, there can be something called expert intuition. Mm. Expert intuition is when you've probably heard the phrase, you need 10,000 hours of practice at something yeah. for mastery, right? And you, you actually don't need 10,000 hours. I mean, it depends on the skill. So that's kind of like an exaggeration, painting with a broad brush. But expert intuition, where you can trust your intuition, comes from repeatedly, many times, performing the same task, getting quick feedback, and having over time developed a sense that you're absolutely getting the right answer you know, whatever you're doing with this task. Mm. So for example, probably most folks listening to this podcast have expert intuition about checking their email and going through it and seeing, okay, they can very quickly tell whether this is an important email or this is spam, right? That's something you probably have most expert intuition. I mean, there are some people who just ignore their email that you probably don't have expert intuition, but most of you have hopefully expert intuition. In. So that's something good that you have expert intuition in because you can quickly tell things. Or when you're driving a car, you can probably, if you have a lot of experience in that, you can probably quickly tell how to drive the car effectively and accurately. 
So there are a number of areas where we have expert intuition. Of course, it depends on your, so if you're an executive, for example, you have expert intuition in looking at a profit and loss statement and quickly telling how division is doing. <laughs> then that, that, of course, you know, or you're a plumber, you can quickly look at, you know, a toilet backed up and see, you know, this is most likely the cost because you have a lot of experience in that. However, we tend to greatly exaggerate what you know, our understanding of what we have expert intuition in. <laughs> and so we feel that whatever area we're engaging with, we are experts in, whereas we are in no way experts in those areas. There's, for example, really interesting studies on doctors performing lab exams, and they assume that they know what the right answer is to kind of you know, diagnosis or treatment. And overwhelmingly, they are, tend to be way too confident about their knowledge. They tend to th- feel like they know what the right diagnosis is, and they don't, and they're way too confident about it. Mm-hmm. So even doctors, you know, get into this headspace where they tend to be way overconfident about the abil- their ability to tell something. Or let's say, just in terms of overconfidence, when you when you look at let's say lawyers, and you ask them, you know, are you an above average lawyer, a below average lawyer, or you know, an average lawyer? You'll find that about 97% of them raise themselves as above average lawyers. So, which is, you know, another the greater than of average level. effect. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. One because of the biases. Perfect. So, this is something that's a bad, bad problem. Now, in terms of there's a separate dynamic. So, that's expert intuition practice. When we talk about empathy, there are some people who are naturally empathetic and good at reading others' emotions. Are you good at that's, that? At empathy? Uh, not intuitively it's something yeah. i had to develop yeah cognitively so, uh, but you've, you've exactly learned, yeah. yeah it's something i learned it's a skill yeah. set that yeah. i developed to read other people's emotions yeah. and so looking at paul ecker's work at micro micro expressions so looking at mm. people being able to read them that's something that i developed there are other things that i have intuitively better skills in just because of my abilities but that's not one of them that's something i developed so there are some yeah. people who will be empathetic and they can quickly respond to others. And so they can see, oh, what's going on? They care about other people's emotions. They respond to them. So they're good at that emotional connection with others. But unfortunately, overwhelmingly, what tends to happen to these empathetic people is that they tend to get too empathetic and they get themselves into relationships where people, they get themselves into relationships that they, that they find to be unhealthy. So for example, if they're too empathetic towards someone, they will tend to attract people who are needy and tend to want to support those people and help those people too much. And because they can't get away from the desire to help those people. And so they end up in, in relationships that are not helpful, where they tend to do much more of the emotional labor than they should. Yeah. Now, emotional labor for folks who don't know that concept, you want to think about your activities, your emotions, how straining those are. We don't realize how much effort we put into engaging emotionally with things. And which lots of people don't realize that emotional engagement is a labor, is work. And that's something that's really important to realize. And it's not nearly valued enough in our society, near, not nearly as much as it should be. That's a separate issue. So people who are empathetic tend to get into these serious problems, and they need to learn about these cognitive biases. They need to learn about them in order to notice when they're getting too pulled in to their relationships with others, when they're responding too much to those folks, and when they are with whom they're in relationships with, and when they're giving too much of themselves. That's a cognitive bias as well. When you're really not serving your own goals and your own needs, when you're just giving to others. Yeah, this is really good stuff. Uh, you know, what what if you're in a relationship and um, are there cognitive biases that you can have that that can actually make you fall in love with someone, but it's actually an illusion? Like you actually, mm-hmm. they're not really good for you, but you're blinded mm-hmm. to all the reasons why they're not good for you because you feel love for them? Yes. So you feel that you should love them. You feel that they are the right fit for you because society tells you or your parents tell you or those around you tell you. But, but what if you feel it, I'm saying, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you feel that gut reaction, of mm. course, so that, that, that you, from the halo effect, all of these other dynamics, you feel that they're the right thing to fit for you. And that's the key. You feel that. Right. You feel, it, and the feeling is always the case. 
You feel certain information is true and you believe it. You feel a certain course of action is the right action. You feel when you're driving, it's the right thing to do to drive, to, you know, cut off that jerk who just cut you off. And then you get into a competition of cutting off each other. Is that the right course of action? Of course not. <laughs> you know, that aggressive driving. But people who have the fight response, you know, I used to do, have the strong desire to do that. And because I have much more of the fight response than the flight response, I have to learn to avoid being aggressive in response to people who are aggressive to me on the road, right? It felt right. It felt like the right thing to do. And so does feeling that, you know, whoever you love is the right person to love. Mm. Who, whoever you feel you targeted with your emotions is the right person to target. But there's a reason we have a 40 plus percent divorce rate in this country. Mm. There's a reason for that. And it's because these feelings are lying to you. They lie to us all the time because we're not in the Savannah environment. That person might have been a great fit for you if you were living in a tribe of 15 people to 150 people in a Savannah environment and you were hunters, foragers, and gatherers. That would be a good mate for you. That's perfect in that time. But in the modern world, they might not be a very good mate for you at all. And our emotions lie to us all the time about whether they're a good fit for you. That's why I talk in the blind spot between us about how you should not trust your gut. You should not trust your heart. You should not trust your intuition. You should always check with your head before going with your gut. Sometimes your gut will be right. Sometimes it will be wrong. But you can't simply trust it in the modern world. You will make way too many mistakes about your relationships, whether in your love relationships, whether in your friendships, whether in your professional relationships, in anything, even in your own relationship with yourself. How, how often do we lie to ourselves, right? How often do we say, I'm going to lose that weight and we, you know, I'm going to do the, go to the exercises. I'm going to be, you know, getting to work on time and we don't. Well, that's because we really don't see ourselves clearly and we fall into these same cognitive biases, these mental blind spots around ourselves too. So how we relate to ourselves. Um, well, under what conditions, do you, do you see any conditions in which we can trust our inner experience our inner uh, emotions and feelings about things um can you can you think of anything sure I, I mentioned before when you want to get yourself out of the way of a moving bus that's a great time to trust but within your relationships i'm saying within relationships you should always check with your head because mm. sometimes again your gut will be right sometimes it will be wrong but you should never simply trust because of all of these cognitive biases so you should never simply trust it's just, you know, just going with a gut is very dangerous in relationships. It will lead you into many, 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 many mistakes, many damages, oh. damaging relationships. What about, it doesn't mean, go ahead. What about the analogous to the bus coming at you? What if you have like, you know, like a psychopath partner and your, your gut's telling you something's just off? Like, can't that be really valuable information? Of course. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes your gut is going to be right. And it yeah. doesn't mean, so uh, that's what I'm saying. Your gut will be right sometimes, and sometimes it will be wrong. And you can't know intuitively when, you can't know internally yeah. when it's going to be right and wrong, because internally it always feels right. That is the key. Internally, your gut always feels right, right. and sometimes it will actually be right, and sometimes it will actually be wrong. <laughs> that's why you can't simply feel that. How many people come to a therapist and have a couple's relationship and say, oh, my partner is a psychopath. And when the therapist in an objective position, looking from the outside in, says, you know, is saying, no, you're the psychopath. <laughs> you know? That, that, and, yeah. Well, that happens a lot with narcissism. A, par right, a, partner, exactly. a partner will say, oh, my husband is so narcissistic because he never pays attention to my needs. <laughs> all the time he doesn't pay attention to my needs all the time so he's narcissistic or she's narcissistic you know um whatever the case may be exactly. but it's exactly. funny right it's funny exactly so that's that's the, and that's what i'm uh, that's what i'm talking about our gut reactions you can never simply trust them in relationships that's why you need to always check with your head and one of the strategies i talk about in the book so there are a number of strategies i talk about to fix these is to get an external perspective. That doesn't mean you need to get a therapist, but that means you need to get an objective external perspective. Somebody who you trust and somebody who your partner trusts, well, if you're just getting the objective perspective of yourself, somebody who you trust and somebody who's gonna give it to you straight. No, so it's not gonna be, you know, just a drinking buddy and supporting you and saying, yes, absolutely, you know, that guy's terrible, or yes, absolutely, you know, 
the, 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 that girl's a jerk. You know, you, you don't want that. You want somebody who'll be honest. And that is one of the many strategies that you can use to address these cognitive devices. Do you recommend that you limit your alcohol intake uh, at uh, dance clubs? Because uh, you're not going to cognitively make too many decisions about who you're going to approach on that dance floor and who you talk to and uh, who you go home with uh, if you have too much alcohol in your system. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I, yeah, I know what you're saying. I'd say that that really depends on your value set and what you care about. If you just care about having a you know bender and you're okay with, you know, ending up at home with whoever and know that you're going to be in a one night stand with no strings attached. That's fine. Sounds I mean, very I nice. Judge. Sounds very nice. <laughs> don't joke there, you go. there you go. I don't judge, you know, yeah. whatever. If that's your goal, that's great. And there's no cognitive biases in there. If that's your goal. Yeah, yeah. But if your goal is to find somebody in the dance club, who you can have a long-term relationship with, you definitely want to limit your alcohol intake. <laughs> Cause you're not going to be making you very smart decisions. And maybe but if you're one-on-one, yeah, if you just go want to other one outlets stand, as well. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But the one night stand, you know, that's fine. <laughs> cool, man. Um, so you bring up this interesting phrase in your book, mental fitness. Yeah. What is mental fitness, and what kind of techniques help us develop it? So I talked a little bit about physical fitness, right? With the diet, where you yes. want to have good physical health. Well, we think about our diet, we think about our physical health. But we don't think nearly enough about mental fitness, about getting the same sort of fitness in terms of our mental strength, mm. our mental ability. And that's what mental fitness is about. You want to improve your ability to make good decisions, to address these blind spots. So it's not simply about kind of, you know, uh, it's, it's not about having dealing with challenges, mental challenges like anxiety, like depression, which are very important to deal with. But that's about trauma. That's about problems that you're having. Mental fitness is about strength. It's about going to the gym and exercising. That's what mental fitness is about. It's about eating your salad. That's what mental fitness is about. So that's kind of just like the physical fitness, that's, there's mental fitness. And we talked about some of them already. So some of them, for example, is getting that external perspective. One of the ways that you make sure that you address problems in the relationships is you can get an external perspective on what's going on in your relationships. Mm. That's one strategy that's really useful. Then another strategy that's really useful is delaying your decision making. Mm. Our you know, emotional system, so we have two systems of thinking, bro broadly speaking, the autopilot system and the intentional system, also known as system one and system two. So the autopilot system is our older brain, the emotional brain, those intuitions, those gut reactions, they take milliseconds to turn on which is great to get us out of the way of a moving bus or to flee a saber to tiger. That's great for that environment or to you know, be sufficiently hostile to an opposing tribal member. So from um, someone from another tribe, but not good in the modern world. So you want to turn on your intentional system, your system too, the more rational part of our brain. That takes you know, a couple of seconds to turn on. And that's why when your mom said count to 10 before making a decision, that's actually pretty good advice. So it's something that research has backed as quite effective in terms of addressing these cognitive biases. So making sure to count to 10, that's one strategy that's you know, in that moment. But when you are strongly aroused, you want to give your arousal around 20 minutes or so to stay. Mm -hmm. And that's the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So we have those two nervous systems. And the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the rest and digest system. It takes about 20 minutes to switch those. So when you're strongly aroused, you want to take a break from, let's say you're talking to your partner and you have a strong emotional arousal. You want to take a 20 minute break and say, let's put it on pause, you know, I'll go to the restroom, you know, get a break and then resume in about 20 minutes. Same thing <laughs> for if you're talking to a colleague in the workplace and get to a really heated place, you want to stop that for you know, 20 minutes. So that's kind of another strategy that you can use. Nice. Another strategy that I strongly recommend to folks to use is to consider your past experiences. We go into the future. I talked about you know, to, to telling your husband you know, for the 10th time to pick up his socks, right? Not a yeah. good strategy because <laughs> it obviously hasn't worked or fat shaming someone or something like that. That clearly has not worked in the past, but we keep repeating the same pattern. Keep repeating and doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. 
it's terrible, it's silly, it's, you know, but that's just how our mind works. So you want to consider your past experiences and decide, do you really want to do the same things that worked, that did not work before in this new situation? That's one, another thing that I talk about. And then I really recommend the folks looking at a situation, consider alternative explanations and options. That's a very good strategy and has been shown to address a number of cognitive biases. When you look at a situation, whether due to the halo effect or the horns effect, whether due to the fight or flight response, anything, we feel that there's only one right way to go. We feel that there's only one right way to look at a situation. But developing that mental habit of immediately considering alternatives, maybe there are other options that you can pursue, other courses that you can follow, Maybe there are other ways of explaining the situation. Maybe the person who cut you off is not actually a jerk, but just didn't see you, or they're driving their wife to the hospital because she's about to have a baby, right? So there's other explanations and options to pursue other options, meaning courses of action, other explanations, meaning interpretations of what's going on. If you have that immediate habit of looking at those in your relationships, you'll be much better off. And I talk about eight other strategies, which you'll have to take a look at the book to know about. You got to read it. You can't give it all away, my friend. You can't give it all away. Well, I just really appreciate you chatting with me today. You know, I want to leave with a quote. You say, we are biased, but we don't know it. So keep that in mind before you make a decision that will lead to debt, regret, and stomach upset. <laughs> I like that quote. Gleb, thanks so much for coming on, being a repeat uh, guest on the Psychology Podcast and, uh, and dropping your wisdom to us. Thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate you inviting me. Appreciate you too. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com. That's thepsychologypodcast.com. Also, if you'd prefer a completely ad-free experience, you can join us at patreon.com slash psychpodcast. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show. And tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.